I'm nothing without you. All of my hope comes from you. No one can replace you. Bow your heads with me. <clears throat> now, Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, give to us the power to preach your word. Thank you so much for all that you have already done. Allow your word to go forth that it might penetrate the hearts of the people present. And we love you and we thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I read in your hearing verses 5 and 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verses 5 and 6, and the word of God says, Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. That's the word of God. You can be seated. I can tell that word didn't move y'all much. But, uh, <laughs> I want to talk about Again, let's show them how it's done. The reason we need to discuss this particular passage on this Father's Day is because when I see this church at Thessalonica, I wondered how could they be this model church? That when Paul talks about them, he says about them that they are unique. And he really applauds them for how they are. He calls them that people need to imitate who they are. Other churches could learn from them. And I wondered how could they become this kind of motto? I wondered, was it just because they were church members or? Was it because of the simple fact that Paul was a great teacher? Or maybe it was because Paul just had a whole lot of help and that's how they were pushed in this direction. Well, when I really pay attention to this church becoming as it ought be 
I discovered that something had to be going on outside of the church. Because in order for people to really become all that God would desire, there must be more than just church attendance involved. That if these people were to be models of ministry as uh, Paul really calls them, they had to have some consistent help at home. Because in order for people to really live for God, it always takes homework as well. Fact remains, that's what's really wrong with the world that we live in now. There is no consistency at home. You can see there is only so much, if people are honest, only so much that we as a church can actually do. Because if people come to church and hear pastor teaching and preaching one way, then they go home and they hear something else, which one do you really think they're more prone to follow? It'll be, it'll be the one that they hear the most. It'll be the one that's probably lifted high at the house. And I don't believe that in the 21st century, many of us don't understand how God expects us to grow. If you can remember when Jesus uh, was 12 years old and he was, got detached from his mother and father, he ends up in the temple, and he's there, and they're looking for him. And when they finally find him, Jesus says to them, um, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? He's in the temple uh, teaching the teachers and all. They're marveling at him, and there's a phrase in the passage where the Bible says about Jesus when he's 12, he increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. That means that when you think in terms of growth, there's always four areas that every individual should be growing in. One is wisdom, which means you ought to be growing mentally. Two is stature, which simply means you should grow physically. Three, favor with God, which means you ought to grow spiritually. But then four, favor with man means you ought to grow socially. And in order for a person to grow accurately in these ways, they can't just come to church and make it happen. Something has to be going on at home. Which means you got to stop blaming school systems and blaming churches and understand clearly that if school is teaching your child one way and church is te teaching your child one way, understand if it's not consistently taught at the house, you're going to always have some problems. And if we're to start becoming models like we're supposed to be, you think in terms of men, men ought to be models for other men. Fathers and those who are in leadership of children and young people have to start being consistent in righteous teaching. And when I look at this text, I discover some things that Paul literally praises this church for. And the things he praises them for are things that many fathers or just parents in general are missing out on teaching on a consistent basis. There are things that not only need to be taught to small children, but fathers need to model these things and teach them to whomever they come in contact with. Now, don't miss me because I'm not just talking to fathers. I'm talking to all y'all sitting in here. It's one thing that's missing today that I used to see growing up and was those in authority always tried to teach all the time. It was not a one-time situation. Always trying to teach something to help shape the child in some way. If another child came around, it didn't matter if you were somebody else's child. They were still trying to teach you as well that you were not on a lonely island just learning in one place. Everybody in the neighborhood tried to help you do right. And we're kind of missing that kind of stuff now. And I'm, all I'm saying is you got to have the same teaching that we do in church. Got to be going on at the house. Has to be going on in your life as a member of the body of Christ. 
You ought to be this consistent teacher who is trying to make sure people understand what a relationship with God is all about. So the idea of father or mentor or man or even mother, or whatever you want to call it, if you have certain roles in life, you're supposed to be a consistent teacher to people. So what is it that Paul shows us we ought to address that we're to show how it's done? All of y'all in here, mem members of this church, this kind of stuff that you help people understand. One is, and I speak especially to fathers of any kind, shape, form, or fashion. Since you're in here, I'm just believing you are a child of God. Um, you got to get busy teaching your children and others, this is for all of you again, to receive God's word. It's going to be an elementary lesson for a lot of you, but just stay with me. Verse 5 says, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. And then the B portion of verse 6 says, in spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Please don't miss the gospel comes to the people through the ministry of Paul and his associates. And many traveling preachers and philosophers in that day were only interested in making money from ignorant people. But the Holy Spirit used the word in great power and the Thessalonian church responded by receiving both the message and the messenger. Hear me well. That in spite of the persecution that was taking place in Philippi, Paul and Silas had been bold to speak the gospel. They were bold and people believed and they were saved because Paul and the others, they preached the word with power and the people received it. That the people never lost that eagerness for the word of God. Please hear me. Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at, is at work in you who believe. That Paul applauds the church at Thessalonica because when they heard the word, they didn't just see it as another book. They didn't just view it as some useless information. They did not let it go in one ear and out the other, but they received the word and accepted it for what God was saying. I want you to know, people of God, that you live in a time now where people have to be taught that if life is to be better for you, you must receive the word. I, I told you, I, I know it's not going to work for y'all. Yeah. You, you, ain't, you ain't getting nothing surface and make you run. Just stay with me. Um, um, you got to receive it. Stop rejecting the word and receive the word. Make sure that you as a believer are actually receiving it. That's why we struggle so much in life because many of us are rejectors and not receivers. So our lives keep on crashing. Um, 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 some time ago, a rash of Flying accidents for single-engine planes occurred across North America. These single-engine airplanes just kept on crashing. And when they did a comprehensive study of the 44 most recent fatal accidents that were involving a certain kind of aircraft, a few lessons from the study stood out. First of all, um, uh, all but one of the accident was listed as a pilot-related cause, all but one. But then secondly, the most surprisingly experienced pilots were responsible for the majority of accidents. Let me say that again. 
<laughs> All but one accident was considered to be pilot related. But they discovered that the most experienced pilots were responsible for the majority of accidents. A few of the accidents were caused by pilots with less than 150 hours of flight time. But over 75% of the accidents were caused by pilots with over 400 hours of flight time. Apparently, these pilots assume that because they already had a lot of hours under their belts, they could cut corners and get sloppy. So, and, but the beginning pilots who had lesser hours uh, were extremely careful and, and they went through some pre-flight routines all the time and they were meticulous about inspecting every ribbit of their, of their airplane. They did it by the book. Come in. The study concluded that the pilots who get overconfident and stop pursuing ongoing safety training are four times more likely to have a fatal accident. Come here, because sometimes we believers are 400 flying hour disciples and accidents take place because we stop doing it by the book. We stop studying the word. We stop showing up at church. We compromise on devotions. We slump on allowing the standards of scripture and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to lead our hearts. And we go on day after day cutting corners. And we start wondering, why am I losing power? Why can't I get any help? Why is my life not as exciting and fulfilling spiritually the way it ought to be? Because you've gotten away from the book. Y'all ain't going to talk back to me. Accidents come <laughs> and you, you, you know better, but you never fess up to why the accident actually took place. So I wonder, are you having all these accidents because <laughs> you don't do it? By the book, um, um, most of us, most of us are not taught to actually um, receive the word. Hey, Brandon, come me down a little bit up here. Yeah, you're killing me today. <laughs> and since we won't receive the word, we end up believing things that we ought not believe. And we actually end up going along with things we ought not go along with. Because whenever the word is rejected rather than received, instead of enjoying the true blessings of God, we only experience that which satisfies our flesh and we miss out on the spiritual perspective for living life that God has for us. Well, you men on Father's Day, let me tell you, there's a dire need for all of you to teach others to receive the word. Because we need, we live in a society where it seems that everything goes. And if people would receive the word, we would not have the problems of being confused concerning all this stuff if we just teach people what the word it says. Stop trying to go by how you think and feel and understand what the word says. Because if people receive the word, there will be no conf confusion about who ought to be married. There'll be no confusion about roles at the house. There'll be no confusion about what a wife ought to do, what a husband ought to do. If people will receive the word, the homes could start making an impact rather than being an insult on the community. If people receive the word, government wouldn't be as crooked as it is. If people receive the word, we would stop thinking that if I had a whole lot of money, my problems would go away. If you just receive the word, it changes everything about your life. Your man will get off the couch and use his energy at the house of God if they learn to receive the word. Women wouldn't just show up out of habit if they really received the word. Choir 
uh, would sing with power if they received the word. Ushers would serve with power if they received the word. Deacons would serve with power. Preachers would preach with power. Congregations would witness with power if the word is received. Because when there's a failure to receive the word, things just don't go right. That's, that's, that's one of the heartbreaking parts of church is for me. I, I, I don't understand how there's a consistency of coming to church and in your head you can eliminate the book and think things supposed to go your way. It makes no spiritual sense. And so do you fathers who come to church and you really believe in Jesus? I'm just saying, start teaching the people, not just your children, but teach people that if life is to be sweeter, the answers are not in receiving what some famous voice says. Not in receiving what y'all guy Steve Harvey says. Not in receiving what Hollywood says, but, but only by what the Word says. I wish I had a witness in. You, you got to know where all the power for your life is. Sal salvation is in the Word. <laughs> Healing is in the Word. Deliverance is in the Word. Teach the Word, y'all. Look. The, the word, get the word, you know, get the word, get the word, stop all it, get the word. All right, and now look, um, 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 according to an old Jewish story, uh, once upon a time there was this four year old boy named Mordecai. He refused to attend school and study Hebrew like he was supposed to because he was Jewish. And whenever his parents tried to immerse his mind in the word of God or the Torah, he would always sneak away and go play on the swing set. Every form of persuasion they came up with, it just failed completely. They couldn't come up with anything. He was a bad boy. He was defiant. He was, he was stubborn. He just would not act right at all. So they were exasperated by his actions, didn't know what to do. So they brought him, even took him to a famous psychiatrist. But even that proved empty. That psychiatrist couldn't help him at all. Nothing changed that boy's heart, which seemed to grow every day distant, away from parents and God and all that together, until one day they decided to go see an old rabbi. They were desperate, didn't know what to do. They take the boy to the rabbi, and he was a warm and a wise spiritual guide. They informed him of what was going on, and when they started explaining their plight, pouring out all their frustration, talking about their despair. The rabbi sat there and listened intently without saying a word. He gently picked up Mordecai, took him in his arms, and held him close to his chest. The rabbi held Mordecai so close enough and tight enough so the young boy could feel the safe uh, rhythmic uh, uh, beating of the rabbi's heart. He was just feeling it, and he was feeling it, and he was hearing his heartbeat. He was feeling it. He was hearing his heartbeat, and all of a sudden, without a word, he took Mordecai out of his arms and placed him in his mother's arms. From that point on, Mordecai listened to his parents. Mordecai went to the Torah and started reading. And when it was appropriate, he would go play on the swings only when they told him to do so. Here's the point, because I know you missed it. That child got calm and peaceful and found rest as he heard the heartbeat of the rabbi. Don't you know the only way to heal your stubborn, defiant, hardened soul is when you get close to God and hear and feel the beat of God's heart? That's the only thing that can settle you down. That's the only thing you can find relief from. And you get that from getting the heartbeat of God from his word. His word has the kind of power to bring peace and comfort to your soul. So we got to show them how it's done by making sure we teach people to receive the word. But then show them how it's done, men, 
Teach people to respect God's ways. Um, the A portion of verse 6 says this. Notice carefully. Don't miss it. He says, Paul says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. I, look, Paul says, you became imitators of us, which is, is he is their spiritual leader. He's their pastor. He's their overseer. That's who he is. And he says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord himself. Now, notice there are a lot of things that God does that many people don't like. Don't y'all miss me. Just stay with me. There are a lot of things God does people just don't like. You know, I mean, a whole lot of things. And one of the things that many people don't like is we don't like how God places people in authority over us. You ain't going to ride with me, but it's all right. I can drive this one by myself. Um, the fact is, most people want to be in charge, and they want certain people leading them. And if the certain person not leading them, they don't want to be a part of it. And they get an attitude, and they say, well, I'm not going to follow. But what you got to understand, fathers, is God's way of leadership is what brings success. Stay with me. And people have been taught, have to be taught to respect leadership. They have to be taught to do it. I ain't going to give no help. Because in order for a child to respect his parents' leadership, that child has to be taught at a young age, I'm the parent, you are the child. I'm not your partner, I'm not your buddy, I'm not your pal, I am your mama, I am your daddy, and you do what I say if you like it or not. Y'all ain't gonna talk back to them. I know. I know. I know. Because if they're not taught this at the house, they don't know how to respect God's ways in other places. But God's way is that somebody, hear me well, His way is that somebody would lead you. You, you don't like it. I know. I know how it is. I know. And one of the major problems there is that people, not just children, grown ups do it as well. Just don't want to respect leadership. They say with me. But note the text. These are new believers, and they not only accept it, because this is where we get messed up in church, they didn't just accept the message. They accepted the one that God sent to bring the message. Hear, hear me well. Hear me well. Don't, don't, don't y'all don't lose me today. They followed them. But notice carefully because God's way was for Paul to be the leader and they followed him. That's simple. And if they were to be the blessed church that they are, they had to respect God's way of wanting to lead them. You see, all the way around, just live with it, you know. And stop acting like it doesn't exist in church. Live with it. It's a reality when you're dealing with God. All the way around, God has established leadership. Uh, you got leaders in government, like it or not, president of the United States, governors of the states, mayors of the city, school, you got leaders, you got principal, you got administration, administrators, you got teachers, home, you got leaders, father, mother, if they're there, or whomever the garden is of the house. Church, you got leaders, you got a pastor up under him, you have deacons, you got ministry leaders, uh, uh, Sunday school teachers, you got people who are in leadership. The point is, no matter where you look, there's a leader somewhere. On your job, there's a leader somewhere. And, and so you gotta, you gotta, you always need people who understand, you have to teach people, especially in this century, that if they're going to be blessed by God, they have to learn, respect the person that God has placed over you. Because nowadays people are taught, if you don't like the person, you ain't got to follow them. Come here, come here. I heard parents tell their children, 
You ain't got to do what the teacher say. Now, I almost said something right then, for real. I, I thought it. Forgive me. Um, you know, I, I heard him say, you ain't, you ain't got to do what they say. Where, where you come from? Where, where you get that kind of a language from? I mean, I, and, then, and then if it's not a child, a person will say, I'm a man just like you are. And? I, I, I'm a woman just like you are. I'm grown. You can't tell me anything. But hear me when I tell you, leadership has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with whether you like the person. Leadership has to do with the position the person holds. You might not be able to stand the person, but God expects you to respect their position. You're getting tight, I know. Your liking them has nothing to do with it ever. I mean, really, when you go to school, sit in the class, you ain't there to get a grade. You ain't there to like the teacher. I ain't getting no help in here, I know. A lot of people in here that you don't like Donald Trump, but look, like him or not, you got to respect the fact he's still the president. I knew y'all were going to be mad at me. You might not like, like your boss, but you got to respect the fact that he or she is your boss. And the bad part is, the reason many people struggle in church is because those of us who come don't respect leadership. Y'all too quiet for me today. It's, it's amazing. I've heard people, I've heard people sit uh, up in, in their ministry acting a fool because they don't like the person leading them. Listen. But this is not about like, it's about leadership. Get your L straight. It's not about like, it's about leadership. You get mad just because your leader won't do things like you feel they ought to get, get it done. But you better learn when you fail to follow leadership, you can end up wandering in the wilderness just like the children of Israel did. You know, you know, we can talk about a lot of stuff when it comes to children of Israel. Children of Israel are always a good pattern for the church to look at and see how we ought not act. The reason a lot of them didn't make it in the promised land is simple. They didn't respect the leadership of Moses. They got mad. They got angry, they got upset, they wanted to go back to Egypt and go right back to where they came from, won't do all that kind of stuff. And so, guess what? God had a promised land for them, but God waited till every last one of them died. And it was that new generation that enjoyed the promised land. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. Sometimes you put yourself in your own death trap because you won't respect leadership. You know, I, 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 I heard people make those crazy statements. Yeah, you know, you don't understand why you're struggling in life. It might be because you won't respect leadership. There are certain struggles that just come that are attached to not respecting leadership. In church, people make remarks like, ah, listen, listen. They, they tell leaders, well, I'm going to respect the pastor, but I ain't going to respect you. It doesn't work like that. I mean, it's the position that makes the difference. Y'all ain't going to talk back to him, I know. That's why most times leaders can't get too common with people that they're leading. Please listen to me. I want y'all to get this. Now, I, don't, I want you to miss this because, you know, you know, I'm a nice guy. Nice guy. Um, but there are certain reasons I do some things. And certain reasons I act certain ways. Because, um, um, um. Sometimes, you know, that old saying is true. Familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, sometimes leaders can't get too common with the people they're leading because people start losing respect for you the closer they get to you. But people got to teach like they used to teach a long time ago. Respect your leader. And I didn't say this while I'm on it because, because it does not matter what I might do with you. Listen, 
I might go sit down and eat at your house. I might go to a game with you. I might go to the store and shop with you. I might play basketball with you. But no matter what I'm doing, my position remains the same and I'm still your pastor. That's why I don't do certain things, don't go certain places with people that I leave because some folk can't handle it. Because, look, I'm serious. As your pastor, don't call me Jones. Don't call me by my first name. Y'all, y'all mad. I know, I know. No, no, no. no don't do, you, you, ain't, you ain't walking up, although you don't like him. If Donald Trump walked in here, you'll still say, Mr. President. I'm higher than the president according to God because I'm pastor. Respect me as pastor. Don't call me Jones. Don't call me buddy. Don't call me pap. A, a friend call me what I am. And people have to be taught that. I don't care if you're a man, put your clothes on and say, look, the best man in the world is the man who knows how to submit himself under leadership. The man who knows how to come before other men and not feel bad because God gave them a position. The man who says, if God put you there, I will support you. I will be what you need me to be. I will help you out. That's the kind of man that God uses the most. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. Because understand, in whatever capacity you're in, when you don't respect the leader, do you know what you're really doing? Look, uh, Romans 13, I just said something about Trump. Well, you know what the Bible says? Everyone, Romans 13, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. I wish I had a witness here. You see that? There's no need of you going around saying you're respecting God and you don't respect the people that God has placed over you. The truth is, when you won't respect leadership, you really cause a major uh, problem in your life. I'm a firm believer now that people just don't respect God. If you respected God, you'd have a different attitude toward those who are over you. I, I ain't gonna. I know y'all ain't gonna hear me. I, when I, was, when I was in college, we, we read a book by Dr. A.W. Tozer. And one thing this man felt is that far too many believers hold a superficial view of God. This has resulted in our worship that's been ripped apart because of the failure to ascribe God to his magnificence and how great he is. There's a story that he says, when Alfred Smith was governor of New York, he agreed to attend a convention banquet. He goes there. When he got there, he discovered that the mostly non-New York audience had a disrespectful attitude toward him. And they observed him as some sort of joke when he walked in. So when the Toastmaster <clears throat> introduced him, he did it in somewhat of a disrespectful way. He said about the governor, he said, and now I give you that great guy, Al Smith. See, y'all missed it. He says this about the governor. So since the governor sensed that the people were slighting his position, he made this point very quickly when he stood to speak. He told how when he was a little boy, he had been taken to see a great parade. and He was holding his daddy's hand tightly as he watched a battalion Passed. He watched another battalion pass. Soldiers were marching. And suddenly, his father straightened up at the parade. His father ordered him, son, take off your hat. The governor of New York is passing by. He told how he took off his hat, gave the crowd his punchline after he took out his hat. He said, gentlemen, the governor of, good, of New York bids you good night. Y'all missed it. 
and he walked out the door. I want to ask you, could there be times when Almighty God walks out of your life and out even of the congregation, out of your house and out of the places where you are, that he walks out because you don't respect the leadership that he's placed over you. That instead of respecting leadership, you just approach God with some kind of casualness, acting like he's a buddy or a pal. I want you to know it's important that Christians learn to respect God all the time. You don't respect God. How you expect those on the outside to respect? If you don't teach your children how certain stuff is not funny, what you expect them to do when they get to school? Everything's a joke. If it's funny or you don't do anything about your child cussing you out, they're going to do it to the teacher. They will raise up against a policeman if they got a cussing parent at the house that don't raise them and rear them right. You have issues out of them because you don't teach them respect. It's something that has to be taught, but it can't just be talked about. You got to do it yourself. You got to teach people to be respectful, especially to those in authority. And when people learn how to submit themselves under authority, life is sweeter. The Bible says, obey them that have rule over you. Submit yourselves, for they watch over your soul. It's not enough for uh, you as a mature believer just to win souls. You, you got to watch for souls to come in. They come in by, from people who are able to obey what God says. So receive the word. I knew y'all weren't going to help me too much today, but respect God's ways. But finally, show them how it's done. You got to be ready for God's will. This is real interesting. Um, in the B portion of verse 6, Paul says, in spite of severe suffering, in spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Now, please, please note, one thing, brothers and sisters, that must be taught to people, you got to teach people. I tell men this now because women probably do it better than men nowadays. But you got to teach people that sometimes it's in the will of God for you to go through hard times. I wish I had it with me. There is no guarantee just because you've given your life to Christ that you're going to always see the sun shining, that you're going to always have it easy. But when you give your all to God, there'll be times when it's his will for you to suffer. Because I want you to get the text. In this text, when these people turn from idols to start serving God, they angered their friends and their relatives, and it led to persecution. No doubt some of them, because they chose to live a life for God, it's no doubt that they started uh, to lose jobs and things like that because faith is always tested. And persecution is one of the tests that come to people that say they're going to give their all to God. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 and 12, I'm done. God bless y'all's heart. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, Bible says they will be persecuted. I come to say that to some men in here. You got to teach them, got to teach people that sometimes in life, hard times will come. And that doesn't always mean it's coming because you've done something wrong. But when you give your life to God in totality, sometimes you just got to be ready for whatever the Lord's will is. Because hear me, God is trying to do something in you that he's not going to get out of you 
If he doesn't take you through some rough patches, do I have a witness that God will use your suffering to make your life better? Because we're just like one writer says, a bar of steel, it's only worth $5. But when they work on steel and make it into horseshoes, it's worth $10. If they make some needles out of it and work on it harder, it's worth some $350. If they make it into some pin knife blades, it's worth $32,000. If they work on it more and make it into some springs for watches, it's worth $250,000. But what the writer says is that the bar has to undergo more pain in order for its value to rise. That the more they manipulate the steel, the more it's hammered on, the more it's passed through the fire, the more they beat on it and the more they pound and polish it the greater its value become do I have a witness here and I've come to tell you that that's what God is trying to do at times with your life that God is trying to get more and make your value go up and so for him to do it there are times he's got to take you through stuff that can hurt you real bad the suffering can sometimes pull at your life and stretch your life and make you feel as if you won't make it on in your life but the good news is when God is taking you through he's really taking you up do I have a witness here I'm done brothers and sisters but God needs some men who will teach others if you just hold on God can get the best out of your life instead of being upset with your problems and pain hold on to God and let God make something great out of you because it might be his will for your life to go in a prison and be turned upside down I'm done brothers and sisters but touch your neighbor and say neighbor just be patient with me the Lord is not through with my life I'm in some pain now I might be suffering now I might have hard times now but when God gets through with my life I'm gonna come out different than I am right now I might be low now but when he gets through I'll come out different I'll come out stronger and brighter do I have a witness here it's because I got him in my life that's enough y'all but it's Father's Day and some of you in here might feel like even if life is bad you don't have a reason to celebrate that maybe you had a deadbeat daddy or maybe daddy is no longer here I've come to tell you you still have reasons to be excited let me show you what I'm talking about you know we just concluded the NBA finals when Kawhi Leonard and the Toronto Raptors dethroned the Golden State Warriors between Kawhi between LeBron Kevin Durant or even Anthony Davis or the Greek Freak well that's what they say but people from my generation know the greatest player 
was Michael Jordan. Do I have a witness here? I recall watching one of Jordan's wins when he won the championship. During one run, Jordan and the Bulls won it all in just three short years after the murder of his daddy. Do I have a witness here? You remember his daddy was shot while he was sitting in his car. He was killed in North Carolina. Well, after the game's final shot, Michael Jordan grabbed the ball, went in the corner of a room, and lay down in a corner, weeping and crying and overcome with tears. Nobody really knew what was going on. And they were trying to figure out, do we talk to him or do we leave him alone? Everybody knew what was happening at the moment. It was Father's Day when they won. So there lay right there on the floor a broken champion with everything in the world. He had money. He just won the championship. But he didn't have a father to grab him by the shoulders and say, son, I'm proud of you. So in the interviews, reporter after reporter asked Jordan what it was like to win everything, have everything, and be loved by everybody. His success and fame, his money didn't matter because they said they could see in his eyes that he couldn't find joy because he didn't have his daddy. He didn't have his daddy to tell him you did a mighty good job. I'm done. It's like living life without God. Having everything you ever want but having no father in the room to celebrate with you. That's why you can suffer because when you go through you not like Jordan. You got a father who's always in the room. You got a father who will come over in the corner and cry with you and hold you, console you, and make it all better. Grab your neighbor's hand and say, neighbor, I'm so glad I got the Lord in my life because I might not have friends. I might not have loved ones, but I got a father that when I need him most, he's always right by my side. I ain't getting enough movement in the room. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, this is why I celebrate Father's Day. Yes, my daddy was probably good. Yes, my granddaddy was probably good. Yes, I've got some good men in my life, but they're not the real reason we celebrate Father's Day. We got a father that loved us so much that he sent his son to Calvary's Hill and his son died at Calvary called his daddy loved us more than we could imagine and uh, Sunday morning got up with all power in his hand now do me one favor go console somebody in the building cause some people looking sad some people looking like life is all over but hug them and tell them if God is your father you got a reason to hold your head up if God is your father you got a reason to lift your hands in the air. If God is your father, you got a reason to have some excitement, have some joy, have some energy, cause can't nobody do you like your father can. He's a father that'll wipe your tears. He's a father that'll rock you to sleep. He's a father that'll pick you up 
and turn you around. He's a father who will make a way out of no way. Do I have a witness in the building? Has the father ever worked on your behalf? Has the father ever healed your body? Has the father ever paid your bill? Has the father ever lifted up your bowed down head? Has the father ever worked out what you thought couldn't be worked out? Has the father ever pulled you through? Has the father ever picked you up? Has the father ever made a way out of no way? And if he's done it for you, lift your hands in the air. Say yes. Y'all didn't say it loud enough. Say yes. You ain't loud enough for me. Say yeah. Say yeah. he will I said yes he will if you know he will lift your hand just one more time and tell him thank you for being my father tell him thank you for holding you thank you for taking care of you thank you for making a way why should you thank him because you didn't deserve it you've been caught up in too much hell you've committed every sin you hadn't been walking right but you're here right now because your father loved you enough and made a way out of no way do I have a witness here? Lift your hands in the air. If you're sure enough glad he did it, and help me holler one more time. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah.